Welcome to uh, the video lecture for chapter 9 on probability. Um, this is a really important chapter for the course and for st statistics generally because in statistics what we're really dealing with is questions of probability. How likely is an event to occur? And in fact, that, that, that question sort of underlies all of the statistical analyses that we'll do throughout the rest of this course and that you find in, in the wider field of statistics in general. So <clears throat> it's very important to be able to ask, you know, we have this event that has occurred. We want to ask, how likely is that event to have occurred, right? What are the, what are the chances that that event, event has occurred or will occur in the future, let's say? And so that idea of probability is really important for understanding how statistics functions. Okay. So we have uh, some really important um, things to talk about in this chapter. First of all, here's the typical you know, outline that you see at the beginning of each of these chapters. Um, let's go on past that, though. Um, the first thing we have to realize is that any event that we're talking about statistically is going to be a random event. That means that for any single outcome, we cannot predict how it's going to turn out. Okay, um, you toss a coin, you know that there's a 50-50 chance of it turning up tails. But you don't know for certain on that single coin toss how it's going to turn out. All you can do is state that there's a 50% chance of getting tails or getting heads or so on. So it's a random event. And so in random events, the outcomes, as it says here, are uncertain. But if we take that random event and repeat it, over and over and over again a large number of times, very often, and almost always really, patterns emerge. Patterns emerge that we can then use to estimate the likelihood of a single event occurring. We define that likelihood as the probability, okay? So probability then of an outcome of a random phenomenon is simply the proportion of times that that event would occur if we repeat that event over and over and over again, okay? All right, so for example, you see down here at the bottom uh, of this figure, you see this table for um, the sexes of newborn um, babies. So the newborn, I'm sorry, the sex of a newborn is obviously random, 50-50 chance female, male. Um, if we want to know, however, the probability of a male occurring at any given birth, then we can look at some historic data that we see here from 2002, 2004, 2006, 2008, and we see that in every year, the probability of male turns out to be about 51%. So you should automatically know that therefore the probability of female turns out to be about 49%, okay? So while we cannot say definitively that any given birth is gonna result in a male or a female, Specifically, we can state the probability of the baby being female or male, all right? In this case, probability of male, and that's how you would write it, okay, is 0.512, or 51.2%. Okay, <clears throat> now let's talk about um, what we call probability models. So, a probability model is just a way to describe mathematically all possible outcomes of some random uh, phenomenon, a random process, okay? Every probability model has two parts. We have, first of all, what's called the sample space. Um, the sample space is simply a description of all possible outcomes. So, you know, if you're tossing a coin, your sample space is gonna be heads or tails because those two together represent all possible outcomes, okay? There is no third possibility. An event is a subset of the sample space. So if we go back and, and talk about the uh, coin tossing sample space being heads or tails, an event would be tails, for example, or an event, a single event would be heads, okay? So the events are the subsets within that overall sample space. The second part of the probability model is what's called the probability, okay? And so this is just the likelihood of um, an event occurring. 
It's assigned, the probability is assigned for each possible event in our overall sample space. And, and that's all a probability model really is. It's it, it, sample space, which is a definition uh, um, or delineation rather of all possible events. And then within that, you have the likelihood of any one of those events occurring. Okay, so for our um, newborn sex data, okay, male, female, the sample space is simply male, female. There's no other possibilities, at least not for humans, okay? Now, the probability of male, as we've already seen from our data, is 0.512, that's an event within our wider sample space. Probability of female, 0.48, or 0.49 actually, 49%, uh, that's an event, a subset of our sample space. So, all we've done here is define a very simple probability model that helps us to estimate how likely a child, a newborn is to be male or female. It's no more complicated than that. All right, let's look at this in terms <coughs> of some other more, uh, other familiar examples. Um, when we look at sample spaces, we can basically lump them into one of two broad categories. They come in two varieties, basically. We have what are called discrete sample spaces and continuous sample spaces. Now, discrete sample spaces, or discrete variables, as they're more often called, um, can take on a wide, I'm sorry, can only take on certain values. Um, usually it's, you know, a number, a whole number, or a descriptor like color, or sex, or, or you know, something like that. Continuous sample spaces can take on an infinite uh, number of values, okay? And we'll see what I mean by that here in a second. But let's look at an example of a discrete sample space. So blood types. So as far as blood types go in humans, you're either A, B, AB, or O. But <clears throat> we can also throw in the RH factor, which is the positive and negative, okay? So when you look at <clears throat> the blood type plus the RH factor, there are eight different blood types. We have type O, which you see here, O negative, I'm sorry, O positive, O negative, B positive, B negative, A positive, A negative, and AB positive, AB negative. So we have eight different blood types. And the percentages that you see there on that table are showing you how common or the frequency of these in the human population. I'm not sure if this is, you know, nationally or globally or whatever, probably nationally. Um, but this is an example of a discrete sample space because there are only eight different outcomes. And you see those eight there in terms of blood types, okay? So for a random person, the sample space then is O positive, O negative, A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative, AB positive, AB negative. So you pull a random person off the street, test their blood type, they're gonna be one of those eight, guaranteed. Okay. Now, you can also see that um, AB negative is the least common, right? AB negative here is the least common, so that person is not very likely to be AB negative. It's only a 1% chance of that. O positive is the most common, so they're far more likely to be O positive, okay? So these are the probabilities uh, within the overall sample space. Now, continuous sample space, again, this is where you have an infinite number of possibilities of events within the wider sample space. So an example, cholesterol level, right? For a random person, the sample space is any reasonable positive value. And the only thing that limits our ability um, to discern between two different people in terms of their cholesterol level is how many decimal places we can take the measurement out, right? You could theoretically take the decimal place out an infinite uh, number of places, and as a result of that, you would never have uh, two people have exactly the same cholesterol level, okay? So <clears throat> the interval of zero to infinity is how we would define the sample space there, all right? That's continuous. Um, continuous is often also referred to as quantitative, okay? Um, Hold on one sec, my uh, pen is not working. Here we go. So, oops, still not working. Hold on a sec, let me get my Apple Pencil to sync. I've already done that. Well, 
It is not working, guys. There we go. Quantitative. All right. So continuous or quantitative refers to a variable that can take on an infinite number of values, okay? Um, discrete, that we talked about before, uh, is often also called categorical, okay? Categorical, uh, okay. Well, my Apple Pencil is kind of crapping out. I think I need to charge that. Um, all right, <clears throat> so let's move on. As an example here, let's say that a couple wants three children. We want to define the sample space. In other words, we want to determine how many possible outcomes there are in terms of the sequence of boys and girls they could possibly have. So let's assume that the first child is a boy, right, boy. Second child could be a boy, third child could be a boy. So that is one possible outcome of in terms of sequence of sex in the offspring for a couple that has three children. They could have a boy, a boy, and third child being a girl, that's another one. A boy, a girl, and a boy, that's a third. And a boy, a girl, and a girl, that's a fourth. Now, what if we have a girl first? Well, then we have um, <clears throat> these four possibilities as well, right? So in total, we end up with eight possible events. All right. Second example here, what's the number of days last week that a randomly selected teen exercised for at least one hour, or at least one hour? Well, there's a possibility of a teen not exercising at all, so that would be zero, right? There's a possibility of a teen exercising for at least one hour each of the seven days of the week, and that would be this point here, okay? Um, so, both of these examples, A and B, are discrete sample spaces because there are only a limited number of possible events that can occur. Here we have eight possible events. Here we have, again, eight possible events. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now, for C, a researcher designs a new maze for lab rats. What are the possible outcomes, excuse me, for the time to finish the maze in minutes? We can imagine that you could put 100 rats in that maze and not one, of, not two of them will have exactly the same finish time, right? So that is potentially an infinite number of positive values. You couldn't have a negative value. Uh, it has to take some time to move through the maze, but you can imagine that each rat is gonna take a different amount of time. You might have two rats that have a very similar time. It'd be 1.0 minutes, but take it out further, one rat is 1.01 .01 minute, the other one is 1.015 minutes. You see how they're different. So depending on how many decimal places you take it out, that could determine how many possible events there might be. So theoretically, an infinite number of possible events. That is a continuous sample space. All right, so let's talk about <clears throat> some probability rules. Um, there are a couple of probability rules here that are most important for us to understand at this point. Um, the first one, well, we'll get to that in a second, but the probabilities that range from zero to one uh, is what we're really dealing with here in almost all the cases uh, for this course anyway. So if we say that a, uh, an event has zero probability, that means that there's no chance of it occurring. If we say it has a probability of one or 100%, that means it absolutely must occur, it will occur. So as far as notation, this is how we would write that. The probability of event A would be greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to one. That's just a way of saying that the probability of that event occurring is somewhere between zero and 100%. Okay, it's just, it's just notation. Don't get hung up on it. Now, <clears throat> the probability of the complete sample space for any event must equal one, right? Um, think about the sample space of sex in humans, male, female. Well, the baby is born, it has to be one sex or the other, right? And so we have the probability of being male plus the probability of being female adds up to 100%. It has to be one of those two. Now, the probability that an event uh, does not occur or take place 
is simply one minus the probability that it does occur. And this is the one that seems to confuse students for some reason. I mean, think about it. If you know that the probability of having a male child is 51%, okay, then what is the probability of a child not being male? In other words, being female. It's 100% minus 51%, 49%. That's the probability of being female. That's all that this, this rule here is really saying, okay? But for some reason, that tends to confuse students a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> let's look at an example. Uh, 2011 National Youth Risk Behavior Survey provides insight on the physical activity of U.S. high school students. Physical activity was defined as any activity that increases heart rate. Here is the probability model attained by asking, during the past seven days and how many days were you physically active for a total of at least 60 minutes per day? Okay. All right, so we have this table which is showing or summarizing the data that was collected. Okay. So what does this mean here? So 15% or 0.15 uh, of people asked said they, they exercised not at all on any given day. Okay. 8% said they exercised for at least one hour on one day of the week. We had 27% who said they exercise for an hour every day of the week. That's what these numbers here mean, okay? So the question here is, what is the probability that a randomly selected U.S. high school student exercised at least one day in the past seven days? Well, you have all these different options here for possible answers. How do you figure this out? You have to read the question carefully. Notice it says that at least one day, uh, this part is in bold. That's the key point, at least one day. Well, right there, you can exclude those individuals who said they did not exercise at least one day, who said they exercised not at all during the week. <clears throat> Look at this one. 8% said they exercised for an hour on one day of the week. That's at least one day, isn't it? That fits the bill. 10% said they exercised two days a week. That's at least one day of the week, isn't it? All of these, from one to seven, meet that criterion of at least one day in the past seven days. This is the only one that doesn't. So if you add up all of these, they have to add up to 100%, right? <clears throat> That's our sample space. It has to add up to 1.0 as a frequency or 100%. So 100% minus 15%, and your answer is D, 0.85. Read it again. What is the probability that a randomly selected U.S. high school student exercised at least one day in the past seven days? 85%. <clears throat> All right. So that's how you have to sort of think about these problems, okay? Okay, now let's talk about what are called disjoint events. So we say that two events are disjoint, or um, you may think of it more easily as mutually exclusive, if those events, whatever they are, cannot take place together. They cannot occur together, all right? So think about it. Male and pregnant, disjoint events. In humans, it's not possible to be male and pregnant at the same time, right? Um, now, what about being male and Caucasian? Well, that's certainly possible. Those are not disjoint events. They're not mutually exclusive. There's nothing saying that because someone is Caucasian, they can't be male, or that because somebody is male, they can't be Caucasian. All right, those are not disjoint or mutually exclusive events. So let's look at these sample spaces over here on the right. So this box that I'm outlining here is our sample space. We have two events, A and B, within it, and the area, the proportion of the total sample space that's encompassed by A and encompassed by B, that represents their individual probabilities, okay? So areas, or are, are probabilities rather, are nothing more than areas here. So in this case, you see that A and B do not overlap at all. They are disjoint events. They cannot occur together. Now, in this second sample space, right, our second square here, which is our sample space, you see that A and B actually do overlap. There's an area where you find them both occurring together, A and B. Those are not disjoint events events. Okay, so these figures here that are kind of showing you these sort of, well, Venn diagram uh, kind of uh, um, 
figures, this is the way you want to think about these problems, okay? So we have two rules here. They're both called addition rules, but two rules that help us to understand this. And again, these are going to be used to help us figure out the probability of one or more events occurring, either individually or together, okay? The first one is simply the addition rule. The addition rule for disjoint events, events that can't occur together. And it says that when two events um, are disjoint or mutually exclusive, the probability of event A or B occurring is the sum of their individual probabilities. Okay, so if you want to know how likely it is that event A or B would occur, because it's, it's an or type thing, you have to add the probability of A occurring to the probability of B occurring, and that gives you your answer. Okay, so think about it this way. Um, male and female are disjoint events, right? Strictly biologically, A and B, or male and female, are disjoint events. So if you ask the question, what is the likelihood of a newborn being male or female? You know the likelihood of being male is 51%, being female is 49%. Add those two together and what's your answer? 100%. Doesn't that make sense? What is the probability of a newborn being male or female? It's 100%, right? That is all that this rule is saying. You add the individual probabilities <coughs> and there you have it. Now, what about the situation where we have two events that are not disjoint, they're not mutually exclusive? This is where the general addition rule comes in, okay? So here, the probability of event A or B occurring is again the sum of their individual probabilities minus the probability that they occur together, all right? So think about it. If you have the probability of A, which is, is the area I'm circling here, and the probability of B, which is the area I'm circling here, if you're considering the probability of A, you are automatically considering this area where A and B overlap. If you're then, second, considering the probability of B, you are also, again, considering this area where they overlap. You're counting that area twice. So you can't, you can't double dip like that, so you have to subtract that area back out once. Okay. If this isn't clear now, it'll be hopefully come clear in a little bit. So let's look at some examples here. Um, go back to the blood types that we talked about before. So the probability that a random person is type O positive. Okay, we see that directly from the table. It's 38%, or 0.38. Now, what is the probability of you know you collecting a random person off the street, drawing their blood? What is the probability of that person having a blood type. That's how you're sort of asking this question here, right? What is the probability of a person having a blood type? Well, in that case, you would simply add up all the probabilities and they should add up to 100%. It makes sense. You take somebody's blood, they're gonna have a blood type. It's a 100% certainty, right? Okay. Now, what is the probability that a random person is not A positive? Well, you know that the probability of somebody having a blood type is 100%, so the probability that their blood type is not A positive is 1, or 100%, minus 0.34, or 34%. So 1 minus 0.34, 0.66. So if you added up A negative, AB positive, AB negative, B negative, B positive, O negative, O positive, they would add up to 0.66, or 66%. All right, fourth. Probability that a random person is blood group O. Blood group O. Well, this is blood group O, right? O positive and O negative added together. So 0 0.38, 0 0.07, 0 0.45. 0 0.38, 0 0.07, 0 0.45. So again, you see it's important to read the question, and the wording of the question is critical. What is the probability that a random person is RH negative, rhesus negative? Well, then you would simply add up all the negatives. So point, uh, so 7%, 2%, 1%, uh, and 6%, 16%, or 0.16, right? Keep in mind, the proportion is considered frequency. You can convert that to a percentage by moving the decimal two places to the right, multiplying by 100, and you get 16%. 
as a percentage. Okay. Last, probability that a random person is either blood group O or RH negative. So either blood group O or RH negative. Okay, <clears throat> so we've already defined or, or decided that the probability of blood group O is 0.45. Why? 0.38 plus 0.07, 0.45. That's blood group O. All right. Now, um, RH negative. We've already determined that that one is 0.16, right? So 0.45 plus 0.16, okay, gives us what? 0.61. But now we have to subtract out the probability of O negative. Why? Because we've counted it twice. O negative is included as blood group O. It's also included as RH negative. So we've counted it twice. So we have to subtract the 0.07 for O negative out once, and now you get down to 0.54. So we had 0.61 minus 0 0.07, 0 0.54. And that's what I meant by counting it twice, okay? Because it's possible to be blood group O and RH negative at the same time. Those are not mutually exclusive events. There's some area of overlap between those two events. And so you have, because you're counting O negative twice, you have to subtract it back out once. Okay, let's look at another example of this with Dalmatians. So um, in Dalmatians, we have the two events we're looking at here is hearing impairment and blue eyes, okay? Hearing impairment and blue eyes. Now, these are not disjoint events. They're not mutually exclusive. Okay, so we see we have our whole or entire sample space here. Okay, that's 100%. That's all Dalmatian dogs, okay? And within that, we have <coughs> uh, dogs that, in the yellow here, that are hearing impaired and not blue-eyed, okay? Over here, we have dogs that are blue-eyed and not hearing impaired, all right? Now, here we have dogs that are hearing impaired, not blue-eyed. That's one way to be if you're a Dalmatian. We have dogs that are not hearing impaired and blue-eyed. That's another way to be. But there's a third way. We also have dogs that are hearing impaired and blue-eyed, right? That's the area of overlap between these two, these other two events, okay? Again, they're not mutually exclusive. It's possible to be a hearing impaired Dalmatian and also have blue eyes, right? Okay. So, the question is, are the traits hearing impaired and blue-eyed disjoint? No, you know that just by looking at the diagram here, there's an area of overlap, okay? So, first question, what is the probability of hearing impairment, all right? Well, probability of hearing impairment is this larger oval. So, we have in the yellow area here, hearing impairment and not blue-eyed. But we also have an area here, 5% or 0.05, of hearing impairment and blue-eyed. This first one just asks about hearing impairment. So we have to take this entire area here, 0.23 plus 0.05, 0.28, okay? That just is a way of saying that this entire area here represents 28% of the larger sample space, which is the rectangle, okay? Again, dogs outside of this are neither hearing impaired nor blue-eyed, okay? All right, second question. What is the probability of a Dalmatian being blue-eyed? All right, well, here we have the smaller oval. So you can be, if you're a Dalmatian, you can be blue-eyed and not hearing impaired. You can be uh, blue-eyed and hearing impaired, okay? Again, they're not mutually exclusive events. So what is the area of this entire rectangle, or um, sorry, oval here? 0 0.05 plus 0 0.06, 0 0.11. All right, now, third question. What is the probability of being a hearing impaired or blue-eyed Dalmatian? The key word there is or, not and, or, okay? So this is where we have to subtract back out once, as we said. Right? So think about it. <clears throat> probability of hearing impairment, as we've already said, is this entire oval here, okay, the larger one. That's 0.28, okay? 
then we have the probability of Lui is 0.11, right, 0.11. But we have counted this area of overlap twice. We counted it the first time when we considered this area. We counted it the second time when we considered this area. So we have to subtract it back out, okay? So, take a look. We have 0.28 for hearing impairment. That's the area of this entire larger oval, plus 0.11 for um, blue-eyed. That's the area of the smaller oval. We counted this area of overlap twice, so we subtract 0.05 out once, and now we get 0.34, all right? Again, that's the general addition rule, right? You have to subtract the area of overlap back out because you actually count it twice when you're doing these probabilities. Okay, so let's look at continuous random variables because this is more what we're gonna be dealing with throughout the rest of the course. Um, most data in terms of, you know, that comes in the form of measurements represents continuous random variables. Um, all right, <clears throat> so Continuous sample spaces are going to contain an infinite number of events, okay? And again, that's possible because you can take any one of those measurements theoretically out to an infinite number of decimal places. So we're going to use what are called density curves, and I've mentioned this before, okay? Density curves, um, we've talked about them in terms of normal curves, right, or curves that are skewed, like we said before. These are density curves. They are nothing more than probability models, okay? They model continuous probability distributions. They are going to assign a probability to any given event over the range of all possible events in that sample space. All right. Um, now, typically, we're going to be dealing with density curves that have a shape very similar to this. So, so normally distributed, or those that are skewed. Right uh, here, we have sort of a bimodal curve. This um, is a sample space where any given event along the x-axis has the same probability on the y-axis of occurring. Uh, we're not gonna talk about those so much beyond this chapter. I mean, you do run into those occasionally, but, but not all that often. Okay, so let's take a look at these continuous probabilities. Um, the first things that we have to realize, the first thing we have to realize is that probabilities are areas. They are areas under this curve, areas under um, the density curve, okay? So events are defined over intervals on the x-axis of a density curve, as you see down here. So if you had, if you define two points, say this point and this point along whatever this x-axis is, you would therefore or then define this particular area that's shown uh, as shaded, right? that area represents a certain proportion of the overall area. The overall area that I'm highlighting here is the sample space. Event A, whatever it is, has to occur somewhere along this continuum, from this value to that value. If you define um, the probability of an event as occurring between any two numbers, say this value and this value on the x-axis, what you're doing is defining an area under that curve. That area is the probability of that event, called event A, right? So the total area under a density curve is simply the whole population or sample space, and it's always gonna equal 100%, because you've defined all possible outcomes for whatever it is you're measuring. Probabilities, as I said, are simply, or simply represent areas under some portion of that density curve. So the area defined by an interval between two values. Okay, oops, sorry. Now, the probability of an event being equal to a single numerical value is zero when, when the sample space is continuous. All right, this is an important point that a lot of times students have trouble with, okay? Um, let's say that we, we want to figure out the probability of this particular value occurring, whatever it is. Well, you have to remember that in these sample spaces or in these density curves, um, these probability models, I should say, probabilities are always areas. They're areas defined between two values. So the interval represents the area. If you're just dealing with one value 
Have you defined an interval? No, you haven't. All you defined is one value along that x-axis. So you haven't defined an area of that curve by just stating one value. So you've not defined a probability. That's probability of zero, essentially, okay? All right, let's take a look at, at uh, this example. So let's assume we have uh, this sample space here, okay? This is called a uniform distribution where any given value along the x-axis has the same uh, chance of occurring or frequency on the y-axis. Again, that's called a uniform distribution, okay? It's not a bell curve. Um, every value or every possible event has the same likelihood of occurring. Okay, so let's assume that uh, we have a continuous random variable here, and again, it's, it has the uniform distribution, which is the square shape, basically, to the density curve. Uh, we can figure out various probabilities as the corresponding areas under this curve. All right, so here we have, uh, let's assume y, right? What is the probability of y occurring? Well, the probability of y being greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to 0.5 is simply 0.5, 50%. So with this first one here, what we've done is defined this area highlighted in orange, right? Between zero and 0.5. Well. Our scale goes to 1, that's 100%, right? Our events have to occur somewhere within this. And if we've said, okay, well, what's the probability of y occurring between 0 and 0.5? It's 50%. It's half of the area of the overall density curve, okay? You can state it another way. What's the probability of y being greater than 0 and less than 0.5? Again, same thing. What's the probability of y being greater than or equal to 0 and less than 0.5? Again, same thing. 50%, 0.5. Now, what is the probability of y equaling 0.5? Well, if you're just stating y as equaling 0.5, you're defining one single point on that x-axis. That's not an interval. Therefore, you can't define an area with just using that one number, 0.5, so the probability is 0. Why would that be? Because if you 0.5 is a number, right? But is it very specific? No. 0.51 is more specific. 0.515 is more specific than that. 0.5156 is more specific than that. You can take it out to an infinite number of decimal places, so you can never really define that number, can you? No. So the probability of that one number occurring is zero. Again, if you just think of uh, probabilities as representing areas between two numbers or an interval such as you see here then you understand it's easier to, to, to understand why it is that a single number or a single event has zero probability of occurring when we talk about the likelihood of an event occurring we are talking about the likelihood of an event occurring between or within an interval on a density curve Probabilities are assigned to intervals, right? The probability of an event corresponds to the length of the interval. So as it says here, any single value has a probability of zero since it is not an interval and thus has zero length on the x-axis. The area under the curve would be zero for a single event. All right, now, let's say we know that the probability of y being less than or equal to 0 0.5, right? That's our interval, is 0.5, okay? And the probability that y is greater than 0 0.8 is 0 0.2, right here, 0 0.2, okay? What is the probability that y is less than or equal to 0 0.5 or greater than 0 0.8? That's our addition rule, remember? It's not the general addition rule because this is not talking about, um, uh, this is talking about disjoint events, right? So the probability that y is less than or equal to 0 0.5 plus the probability that y is greater than 0 0.8 is 0.7, or 70%. So y could occur here with a 50% chance. It could occur here in this interval with a 20% chance. What's the probability that y is greater than or equal to 0.5 or greater than 0 0.8? 0 0.5 plus 0 0.2, 0 0.7. All right, that's the probability of y occurring under those under that scenario. Okay. All right, 
Last thing to talk about is the concept of risk and odds. And this is something that um, people get wrong all the time, especially in the news media and that sort of thing. Um, this is a concept actually that's more applicable with regard to the health sciences. So in the health sciences, probability concepts are often expressed in terms of what are called risk and odds. Risk is more straightforward than odds. Risk is simply um, the probability of some outcome. If we're talking about disease, that's an undesirable outcome, and the risk of an undesirable outcome of a random phenomenon is the probability of that outcome. So the risk of developing cancer, okay, colon cancer, let's say, equals its probability. Risk is probability. That's straightforward. Where people get into trouble is when they start talking about odds, okay? The odds of any outcome of a random phenomenon is simply the ratio of the probability of that outcome over the probability of that outcome not occurring. And this is what people don't understand about odds, okay? So the odds of event A equals the probability of event A divided by, by one minus the probability of event A, all right? Now, this is where I wish my Apple Pencil was charged. I apologize for that because I, I can't write out the uh, Punnett square I was going to for uh, this next example. So let's take a look, okay? So sickle cell anemia is a, an inherited blood disease that affects the shape of red blood cells. Individuals carrying only one copy of the defective gene called sickle cell trait are generally healthy but may pass on the gene to their offspring. So if individuals um, who do not have sickle cell anemia are carriers, okay, as we call them, they're heterozygotes. So let's, let's, let's say that um, the recessive form of the, the gene, let's call it lowercase a, is what causes sickle cell. The heterozygote has a dominant, a capital A, and a recessive, a lowercase a. They're a heterozygote, okay? Let's say we have two parents that both learn that they are carriers, they're heterozygotes. They have a dominant A and a recessive A, uppercase A, lowercase A, all right? Now, they learn from prenatal tests that they both carry the sickle cell trait, so genetic laws of inheritance, think about Gregor Mendel and his pea plants, all that, tell us that there's a 25% chance that they could conceive a child who will suffer from sickle cell. So, and this is where I wish I could draw out the um, uh, um, Punnett square. So if you have two parents, think across the top, you have capital A, and lowercase a, down the side, capital A, lowercase a, right? That bottom right-hand square, that Punnett square, is where the two lowercase a's would come together. That would be a child who had sickle cell disease, full-blown sickle cell, homozygous recessive, right? Two of the other cells would be heterozygotes like the parents, and the upper left-hand cell would be homozygous dominant. So those three, the homozygous dominant offspring, the two heterozygotes, would not have sickle cell anemia, okay? The child in the bottom right of that uh, Punnett square would have sickle cell because they would be homozygous recessive, all right? So, the risk of conceiving a child, in this case, between those two parents who will suffer from sickle cell, in other words, be homozygous recessive, is 25%, right, 25%. One of those, three of the others. So, one cell being homozygous recessive, the other three not. That's 25%. All right. Again, that's risk. That's straight up probability. It's simple. The odds is the ratio of two probabilities. So the odds of sickle cell anemia equals 0.25 divided by 1 minus 0.25. The probability of having it over the probability of not having it. Right? Do the math here. It works out to 0.33. We would write that as odds of one to three, or one and three. Most people, when they look at that Punnett square with four cells in it, one of which contains an individual who has sickle cell and the other three that don't, most people would say that's odds of one and four. There are four cells after all, right? But that's wrong. The probability is 25%. That's the risk. The odds is the ratio of having that outcome over not having that outcome. The probability of having that outcome, which is 0 0.25, 25%, 0 
over the probability of not having that outcome, which is 1 minus 0.25. So do the math there, you end up with 0.33. That's 1 in 3. If you look at that Punnett square, which has four cells in it, one of which is homozygous recessive and the other four, three are not, and you call it odds of 1 in 4, you're actually saying the risk or probability of getting sickle cell is 20%. That's not what it is, right? The risk is 25%, which is odds of one in three. And that's where people usually go wrong. You see it all the time in the news media and, 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 and whatnot, people using odds incorrectly, okay? It's a, it's a small thing, but it, it's an important thing. Okay, <clears throat> so that wraps up then chapter nine on uh, probability, all right?